encryption just hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone, and welcome back to the Time Shifters Podcast. This is Christopher here, as always, with Tom. Tom, how the heck are you? I am freshly shaven. <laughs> <laughs> you won't hit the, we won't hear the, uh, the the whiskers in the in the recording anymore. I don't know. Uh, it is a day old, so you could probably hear a little bit of that. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, and you're back on your home turf. I am. Yeah, it was great having you in. Uh, in studio last episode that was a lot of fun yeah that's always a good time when we can arrange it (laughs) yeah i wish it could happen more often yeah it's that seven and a half hour commute (laughs) yeah yeah it's a little bit much but we only get together we only record every every other week come on you know (laughs) well then i figure you're due for a trip (laughs) yeah (laughs) We'll, we'll alternate back and forth there you go so what have you been up to, sir? Oh, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful world of work and all that. Um, but there is a topic I wanted to get into early on because my son and I, uh, I've mentioned it on the show before, we've been di- dipping heavily into um, Night Court. Yes, um, yes, the classic, the old Night the Court. The old Night Court. We've even watched the new Night Court as we progressed as well. But, uh, uh, but... We finally finished the ninth season of Night Court, um, and we're confused um, because as we watched it, uh, it it was obvious that the ninth season was trying to bring character story arcs in for a landing of a kind. This is the season that Bull gets married. Um, Christine runs for Congress. Uh, All of these things, Harry has lost a love these things are all all happening in this season. So we get Bull married off. We get up, and, and this is like literally he gets married one or two, maybe three episodes before we're into series finale. Um, and then you get up to the series finale, which is essentially a two-part episode. And as soon as you finish watching what is clearly the end of the series, there's one more episode. And the one episode, its story arc is completely out of character with everything else that you just watched. Um, That's odd. It's so Freebie or whatever it is got something out of sync, huh? No, uh, Freebie is literally has the episodes in the order in which they were aired. Freebie doesn't have it out of order. I looked this up. NBC. Uh, When it came to the end of the series, created an evening where for the for a one hour block, they showed the two part series finale. And then the very next week, they aired a new episode of Night Court. (laughs) And it had nothing that it didn't fit in any of the continuity. And it was very weird because, like I said, uh, so Mac had been going to to to. law school for the longest time but for some reason he started getting into filmmaking that's where the whole uh, bull's wedding kind of came in because he shot the video for it and then he got critically acclaimed for the very odd production of their movie (laughs) and it it ended up being this like cult classic thing get kind of formulating um and I even remember the name of the film. He called his film of Bull's Wedding Canubial Fusion. <laughs> and and that, that was a whole thing. And while all this is happening, Christine is starting her run. She's been picked to become a candidate to run for Congress. She runs. So in the series finale, we we have some weird stuff going on. We've got... Harry's getting a thousand job offers. We've got Christine is, uh, the campaign is finishing out. She wins. 
She's going to go to Washington. Harry has the potential to pick another job. Mac has declared he's going to quit law school and concentrate on film. Um, Bull's married. Everybody's... uh, Oh, and even in the very part of the finale, Dan, who has been persecuted by his uh, return to um, his lecherous ways, has had an epiphany that he shouldn't do that any longer, that he should really pursue a woman of his heart, and he's decided that was Christine. So he's going to follow Christine to D.C. So basically all the characters are all going in different directions. The oddity of the series finale, though, is even though we've only married Bull off a few episodes ago, uh, he is being followed by two older men who say they're from Jupiter, and they take him to Jupiter. That's the end of the series, is Bull leaves from Harry's office with these two older men to go to Jupiter. That's it. Series is done. Okay. One week later, (laughs) Christine is uh, still the uh, public defender. Dan is still the uh, prosecutor. Harry is at his bench. Mac is gone. We do not know why. Bull is filling in as Mac's replacement as court clerk, and it just carries on like a normal episode, and that's it. And then that's the end of Night Court. <laughs> that's bizarre. I wonder when Sweeps Week hit. Kind of. Uh, like, th- this definitely has to do with the way television worked in the early 90s. Mm-hmm. So... No, someone was definitely trying to grab some ratings, or there was something on some competing network that NBC was desperate to beat out. And so they fit in like the finale a week early or something. Actually, I know for a fact in 92, I, I would have been in the Navy at the time. So, so my li- the likelihood that I caught those all on their first run is not super high. So I yeah, probably I, caught it in syndication. I thought I watched all of Night Court. 92 was starting to get into the, you know, I was out of high school. I was working a full-time job. Yep. Some of what you said has like vague familiarity. Other stuff I doesn't sound right to me at all. So I have no idea whether I actually watch these or not. Well, no, and given the age range that uh, Night Court occupied in my life, yeah, I probably caught most of it in syndication rather than uh, first time showing. So, so yeah, us watching it in the actual order in which they were aired and then Bizarre. seeing this, like... Yeah, it became a head scratcher. My son and I just immediately start, <laughs> started researching, like, what happened? Where did this come from? So That is bizarre. Yes, it, it quite was. So, But um, made for some entertainment for us from the perspective of what the hell happened. <laughs> now you, you and your son will have to find another series to start binging. I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to get him into Gilligan's Island. You should give that a shot. My son actually really enjoyed Gilligan's Island. Of all things, I thought that it was hilarious. Of all the things I've tried to show him over the years, and some he's liked and some he's just kind of shrugged at, Gilligan's Island was the one thing that he really got a kick out of. The the one that I'm... A, it, it, it's because he's my son and he's trying to appreciate the things that I like is he is actually trying to make his way through... Um, the entire catalog of Star Trek, and he is in the middle of the original series right now. So wow, that's impressive. Yeah, All right. like we wa- I, I sat with him while he watched Space Seed. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. I was hoping to get into uh, Trek with the family, uh, but we uh, we got waylaid with Doctor Who. It took a, even a little. I knew it was going to take a while, but it took a little longer. We had to make some pauses and stuff because life just got in the way, and now. He's going to be off going to college, so not going to happen. Yeah, you, well, with, when you're talking Doctor Who, if you're going to try to watch all of Doctor Who, you need damn near a lifetime to do it. <laughs> well, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> we we went back to 1963, and we watched every single uh, story, including the lost ones that had the uh, the recreations with the, the still photographs and the audio. Oh, wow. We, we watched it all. 
all the way up to the most recent uh, finale, which may be, since it's moving to Disney Plus, and I don't have Disney Plus, may be the last Doctor Who I watch in quite a long time. Wow. At least new Doctor Who, anyway. We'll have to see what we can do about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's fine. I've got 60 years <laughs> of, of, of Who to look back on. I, I'm fine. I pretty much, as soon as we finished... Uh, at all i kind of looked at the my wife and my son and went well time to start over (laughs) i'm sure that went over well (laughs) like nope we're good (laughs) hey we've catered to you long enough (laughs) yeah i think there there was a little bit of that i i I think my um they kind of enjoyed it and there's all but mostly was kind of like uh it was a little bit more of the the challenge of actually doing it Mm mm-hmm I definitely I think that was a little bit more of my wife. I think I think Ben liked it well enough. Yeah. He liked some of it more than others. He definitely agreed that some of the stuff in the latter years were kind of like, eh, but that really got to the, we just want to finish it now. <laughs> yeah, but Not having as much fun as we were, you know, as we did in the old ones, just kind of want to finish it. You know, back when he was five. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> It didn't take us that long, believe it or not. We were able to do it probably within two and a half years, I think, total. Maybe even less. Wow. Yeah, so we did, did, we did pretty good. You, you, you did, but that, that is a daunting library to make one's way through. Yes, absolutely. What else is up? <laughs> just talking real briefly about uh, watching things. Uh, one of the things I watched just recently, it was inspired by uh, listening to the Film Gazers uh, podcast last month since it was like Shark Week and all that stuff going on yeah. on like Discovery Channel or whatever. They did uh, shark themed podcasts. So they talked about Jaws. Of course. Great. Good movie. But they also talked about Deep Blue Sea. Okay. And I happened to notice that Deep Blue Sea was available, I think, on Prime or Max, one of them. And so I watched Deep Blue Sea for the first time in who knows how long, probably not since it first came to a uh, home video or something. That that's a fun film. Uh-huh. Do you remember that I one? I do. Yeah, that's just like like classic sort of monster movie, but it's really good and it, it, it subverts a lot of expectations, you know, probably purposefully. Sure. But it's still kind of really refreshing to see. No, it's been a wa- bit since I've seen it, but yeah, I remember that's a fun one to catch. I guess I wasn't surprised because I remember enjoying it a lot when I first watched it. So I, and listening to them, I, they reminded me a lot of it. And like, oh yeah, yeah, I should watch that again. And yeah, watching the whole thing, it, it's really it's a lot of fun. And uh, the cast is pretty great. And I sat there for the longest time trying to think, where in the world have I seen some of these people before? <laughs> I had to go look them up. And once again, it's like, oh right, he's the cop in the Expanse. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, I get, yeah, he was in that, wasn't he? Yeah, he's like the star. I was just trying to picture who that that was again. It, the thing I was uh, marveling at that particular one is they actually came up with a creative reason why to be around such a dangerous animal. Right. Yeah. Why? Why did they do it? Yeah. Yeah. There was actually reasons for it, and they knew they were bad reasons, and people called them out for their really bad reasons when it when it when it started hitting the fan. Yeah. No. But yeah. No, now. Now I'm gonna have to go back and watch that one too. <laughs> it's it's definitely worth one that is worth uh, revisiting. The only thing I wanted to bring up this was a news story that just came out uh, recently here, uh, at the time of recording anyway. That uh, Disney has announced by multiple sources have, have been saying this now that they will no longer be selling DVD and Blu ray discs in Australia and New Zealand. The last disc that they will sell will be Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And after that, I think that's released on August 1st. So after that, whatever is available, once it's gone, it's gone. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Now, I didn't know that they currently. They, they stopped selling physical media in uh, Latin American markets a while ago and some Asian markets. So I did not, I was not aware of that. Yeah, that's new info. I didn't realize they cut anybody off already. Right. So now they're actually starting to do it in some you know, like uh, English-speaking uh, nations as well. 
And there are some articles who have picked up on this news that see this as like the uh, a coffin or a nail in the coffin of physical media. I don't know. I, I think that's a little uh, hyperbolic, but also maybe Disney is a big one. They have a whole crap ton of properties that they're not going to be selling physical media of now. You can kind of see both sides of this. I, I mean... Physical media is just that, physical. It requires packaging, it requires marketing, it requires distribution and sale. There, there's a lot of investment that's involved in getting that out there at, to varying degrees of profitability. So Yeah, they, they cite declining sales as the reason for doing it. But that other side, it directly competes also against having their streaming services. So... The, the existence of physical media is the thing that would preclude you from necessarily going out and purchasing their streaming service. If you, if you don't have access to it anymore, this is the only way you get it. But then we run into the problem that is plaguing the industry right now, which is where streaming services are taking down large volumes of content. So... Mm -hmm. Physical media is how you get around your favorite movie not being available on a streaming service. Oh, and I could definitely see Disney pulling the same kind of crap they used to pull with their physical media. They would constantly have the for the last time this decade, right. you know, releases of The Little Mermaid or whatever it is, and then it would go away for five, six, ten years. Yeah. And then it would come back in the, um, some anniversary edition or something like that. I can see them pulling the same thing with their uh, with their streaming service. True, but then I will also interject. If you're going to own all of this property, you're not going to give an outlet, and you're going to control when it's distributed to the co to the service so that it's available. You're inviting larger amounts of piracy. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say, do you, when I read this article, I, I think the headline should be, do you want pirates? Because this is how you get pirates. <laughs> it, I, exactly. I mean, that's where this kind as soon as you try to too much stranglehold the availability of content is when you, there there's a black market that will be happy to fill your gap. <laughs> so, yeah. careful what avenue you travel down. <laughs> Yeah. Now I understand. I the um, the convenience mm -hmm. of streaming. I I absolutely understand. Sure. Uh, I have streamed films on services that I own, but it's kind of like ah, uh, I'd have to get up, get the disc, sure. put it in the player, switch the input on the TV. You know, here I can just click play. So I mean, I get it. Yeah. But like you said, that movie may disappear from that streaming service. But I could, oh, oh, it's gone. That's a shame. I was kind of in the mood to watch that. Oh, yeah. Get the disc, put it in the player. <laughs> you know, I've got it. The funny thing is I found the reverse version of this very recently. Um, you and I have talked repeatedly in the past about things like Babylon 5. Yeah. It was available for a good period of time on HBO Max. And then it came down. Coincidentally, it is now available on Blu-ray <laughs> <laughs> to purchase the entire uh, the entire series, and you just got to go. Are, you're doing this on purpose. <laughs> oh, that uh, that was absolutely the reason they they took it down well before the release, mm -hmm. just to increase the uh, desire, and then oh, here it is, and now that's where the only place that you can watch it is if you buy that Blu-ray. Right, and then once the new movie is available by whatever method that they're going to put it out into the world, I know you can already pre-order the Blu-ray for that, but as soon as that goes to a streaming service, then so will the series again. So The articles and the people that are assuming that this is going to be the end of physical media, I, I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. It may be the end of... Um, sort of like a mainstream physical media mm -hmm. outlet. Uh, but just like vinyl records never truly went away. Right. Uh, it just became sort of like a, this niche market. 
even VHS. Honestly, there are people out there that still collect VHS tapes. Good luck finding something to play them on. But <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think you'll just it. Yeah, it all just becomes sort of just niche collector items. No, I, I, I think I think you've latched onto something. Uh, much like vinyl, uh, as long as Blu-ray is the standard for physical media you're going to see the market ebb and flow. There'll be an anniversary edition, a criterion collection, a, a, the, the ultimate version of this with all of its potential variations available in this box set. You're, you're going to find that kind of stuff. Oh, or definitely just like third parties. Yeah, Disney will say that, no, the only way you're going to watch our stuff is on our streaming service or whatever. Until some third party says, yeah, well, we'll pay you this X amount of dollars if you give us the right to produce this limited run. Mm -hmm. And they'll go, oh, like Criterion or something sure. like that. And they'll go, oh, well, all right, sure. Yeah. And or, yeah, or, you're going to be able to have it out like that. Or the anniversary editions or what. Yeah, you're, you're going to see that start to be kind of where this all comes from. I, I look at this, I, like I said, I, I know the article is maybe exaggerating a little bit, but I, I do look at it with some amount of uh, trepidation, I guess. It could be the start of a path that leads to, if not the total elimination of it, the significant reduction. All right, well, that's all I wanted to really talk about, and uh, I think we'll go ahead and take a break here. I will listen to a promo for another podcast. And then when we return, we are going to look at 2009's Watchmen. Welcome to Film Gazers, a podcast focusing on the science fiction, horror, fantasy, trinity, and 20th century entertainment. I'm Steph. I'm Jess. We're cousins slash besties. Join us as we reminisce, discuss, and review films from our childhood. Follow on Instagram at Film Gazers and listen to the show wherever you like to get your podcasts. Later, taters. Time, I suppose. Watchmen. One of us died tonight. Somebody knows why. Somebody knows. I heard he'd been working for the government. Maybe it was a political killing. Maybe someone's picking off costumed heroes. John thinks that there's going to be a nuclear war. What if that's why someone wants us out of the way? So we can't do anything to stop it. An attack on one is an attack on all of us. Watchmen are over. What do you suggest we do about it? Retribution. We can save this world. Why would I save the world? I no longer have any stake in. Do it for me.
Watchmen was directed by Zack Snyder with a screenplay by David Hayter and Alex C. It is based on a critically acclaimed graphic novel of the same name, written by Alan Moore and illustrated by Dave Gibbons, which was originally published in 1986 through 1987. The film stars Billy Crudup, Malin Ackerman, Patrick Wilson, Matthew Good, Jackie Earl Haley, and Jeffrey, Jeffrey Dean Morgan. The film, like the comic, takes place in an alternate 1980s. Richard Nixon is a five-term president, and superheroes have been outlawed, with the exception of a few government-sanctioned vigilantes. One of them, Edward Blake, a.k.a. the Comedian, is brutally murdered. Investigating is a masked man known as Rorschach, a former member of the Watchmen, who refused to retire and now works outside the law. He theorizes that someone may be out to knock off masks and warns his former fellow crime fighters. Former Night Owl, Silk Spectre, and Dr. Manhattan don't initially believe him, but when an apparent assassination attempt on Adrian Veidt, a.k.a. Ozymandias, occurs, it appears to confirm Rorschach's suspicion. They begin to investigate themselves and slowly uncover a much larger plot than any of them could imagine. I can't remember if I saw this in the theaters. I want to say I probably did, because this seemed like something that was going to be, this was going to be something. I think we went and saw this in the theater. Um, I know that I did, because uh, to this day I'm amused, because this was a situation where, while I was married at the time, it was a group of guys that were interested, and we took our wives <laughs> with us to see this and we kind of knew what we were in for but they did not yeah understood uh and like we uh talked about i think we briefly started mentioning it at the end of our last episode i had not read the graphic novel prior to seeing the film so i know i went into the film completely blind uh with and then i went and followed up by reading the graphic novel afterward uh, interestingly, uh, I did basically the same thing, although I was familiar with the story, so I hadn't actually read the content myself. It wasn't until after that I actually went out and collected the uh, the large book of the mm -hmm. collected work. Yeah, yeah, I did the exact same thing. And I remember even seeing this in the, uh, the first time, I loved the hell out of it. Mm-hmm. I, I thought it was a really fun film and probably one of the best superhero films that I had seen in quite a while. I mean, around this time, uh, we'd had a couple decent ones uh, going back to like 1989's Batman uh, and then jumping forward, you know, 10, 20 years, we get, uh, I think we had a, a, an X-Men film or two. Uh, and this is, believe it or not, this is still the time of Chris Nolan and uh, his version of Batman. Dark Knight was out, too. And out of all of them, I really found myself enjoying Watchmen more than any of them. No, quite. Um, and to be clear to our, our listeners, uh, Christopher here had watched the theatrical release while I watched the ultimate release. <laughs> oh, yes. When we get to actually talking about the uh, the films that we watched for the for this episode, correct. I did watch just the theatrical at the, what was it, two hours and 42 minute uh time frame there yeah where the ultimate comes in at an, a full hour longer <laughs> yes <laughs> i was gonna watch the ultimate but unfortunately that one is not available on uh, on max whereas the theatrical was interestingly enough though on max you can watch the essentially a a narrated version of the comic yeah, the motion, the full motion comic is available on there, and I think that's all. That might be a, a big uh, four-hour watch as well. At a minimum, they're about a half hour each. There's ten. <laughs> okay, so there you go. You all do the math. Yep. Like I said, I did go back and read the graphic novel after seeing the movie, and I remember actually really enjoying the graphic novel as well. I was hoping to maybe get into it a little bit before we recorded here, and I, I just wasn't able to get in i wasn't able to crack into it yeah no it, it, it well it's sizable content even as a graphic novel getting right into it um and, and remembering what i remember from the graphic novel versus the movie this is actually one where first off the ultimate version yes uh follows the graphic novel almost to a t right down to uh um there is a comic 
that the the kid at the newsstand is reading that we meet periodically through the uh, telling of the story. And in the ultimate version, you get an animated version of that comic at the stages in which he is reading that. It, it, it is a story that is paralleling the the activities of the movie and the story itself. So it's a it's a parable within a parable kind of thing, gotcha. which is very very cool. And um, oh, I'd have to uh, damn it! I forgot to look up his name. Uh, it, it's a well known actor that's doing the narration of the character from from that. Um, Gerard Butler. There, I remember. Mm. Gerard okay. Butler is the uh, the the voice actor for the character from that from that animated series. But uh, I was thoroughly impressed at how many, uh, and, and it happens in the theatrical as well. There are full on perfect scenes that are even the cinematography is meant to capture that that cell within the graphic novel to show you. We have paralleled this as closely as possible. And I'd have to go back over the content thoroughly to get, gauge the differences, but the only difference that I ever really come away is that ending. And right. I, I actually like the movie's ending better. Yeah, thank you. I was going to mention that. It was going to be one of the ones I one of the things I brought up. Mm-hmm. Of course, the ending the in the book, I think it was uh Ozymandias creates like a giant alien squid yeah. that destroys only New York. Yes. In the hopes that that will unite the world against some potential alien threat. And whereas in the film, he gets uh, Dr. Manhattan to build these uh, energy reactors, which are then spread around the world into all the major cities, that he then explodes mm-hmm. to blame Dr. Manhattan to make it look like Dr. Manhattan was responsible and then giving the world an actual physical... They give them a unified enemy. (laughs) Yes, thank you. I can't... A common enemy was the word I was looking for. Anyway, (laughs) uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that works better than than, than the book. Uh, The only thing I uh, wish that the movie had done is when they do pull off the effect of the reactor detonating and essentially wiping out a perfect orb-shaped portion of the city, we only see New York. It would have been yeah. nice to get more of a sense of it around the world, even if he just had a like a pan out shot of all of these blue orb explosions going off on the globe. Yeah, that'd be very cool. That would have been very cool. Yeah, uh, that would be the only addition to that that would have really kind of solidified what just happened, mm-hmm. um, especially since this is supposed to be an event that scared the living shit out of the entire globe to go, all right, (laughs) we got bigger problems than shooting nukes at each other. That ending and why uh, Ozymandias was giving these reactors around the world and everything was all to help uh, solve an energy crisis. And that energy crisis is also something that is not in the book that was fabricated right. for the film because you have to have one without the other. You have to have a reason of why is this guy giving everyone free energy and why would everyone so willingly take it? Mm-hmm. Um, because in the actual book, uh, Dr. Manhattan's powers have allowed the world to advance technologically a lot faster than it did yeah. by 1980. So, like, electric cars and that sort of thing were pretty commonplace. And so that's dropped in the film. So in the film, it's... Technology-wise, everything feels very 1980s. Right. Yeah, I, I like that because, one, it kind of grounds it into a reality that we can connect with a little bit more as an audience. Sure. Because, okay... The energy crisis thing is still a thing. Right, you know, absolutely. We, we, we don't have this clean energy reactor made by some omnipotent being yet. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the idea that of uh, the energy crisis or, you know, the idea of, uh, of uh, still having, like, gas lines or something like that, like he did in the 70s mm-hmm. um, during the OPEC strike, I, that works. That's something that we can kind of grasp and we can wrap our heads around a lot easier. And so I, it, it worked really well for this film and led the, and then led to a really good, it, it led to a really great ending. No, th- this, this movie, especially in its 
full length entirety is an amazing noir mystery. Yeah. Honestly, there's a lot of changes in the film from the books that I actually prefer. I think it's their great ideas. Uh, in the film, they actually give an origin as to why there was masked crime fighters. Mm-hmm. In the film, they talk about, well, uh, cops were mimicking the crooks who would wear masks so they couldn't get pegged as a, you know from crime scenes. And according to Alan Moore, they were just inspired by the world's first superhero, Hooded Justice. So some guy decided to put on a mask, and he did really well, and then everyone just mimicked him. Like, that maybe works in the comic book but sure. <laughs> that that doesn't work in like the that wouldn't work in the real world i i love the idea of the cops going well wait a minute or of some cops you know like let's let's do it this way and we can do our job and then we can be a little bit i mean it's a good bad thing you got cops to deciding like oh we can be a, go outside the law as long as no one sees our face so there's it gives it a little bit, actually, a, a, a darker tone, a darker edge, I think, to it. No, and, and having Hollister, the original Night Owl, um, go over that that point, that whole, that he was the cop, and mm-hmm. that's how they came to this That was awesome. That was an amazing, nice touch. Yeah, no, I just, I really like that. Like I said, it, it does give the... the heroes quote unquote sort of a, a a darkness to them you know that they are effectively bad cops <laughs> you know? yeah i'm tired of having to wear this badge and not killing the bad guys let's put on a mask and then i can do it <laughs> you know? now now i'm gonna interject uh the one thing that still puzzles me from this film uh, and you're not you're gonna find it hard for me to pick on this too much um, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll just state it outright. I actually love this film. I, I love it in its full length, ultimate cut. The the only thing that I could agree with anyone is because it is a full length cut, and it it really does emulate the comic almost scene for scene. In some cases, its length can be <laughs> some of its undoing. A little daunting, yes. But the only thing that we've never gotten a satisfactory answer for is everyone who is a superhero is super in some capacity. Like, when they fight at, at, as who they are, they seem to have superhuman level strength. They're able to pit, punch through through granite and and they break people in half in a heartbeat and it's never really clear is there something that differentiates them from just another guy i love the whole these were cops that were tired of seeing people put on masks and robbing other people so they put on masks to finish the job that the law didn't do but at what stage did they become super strong? <laughs> well, I think the super strong, I mean, we see, we definitely see like the comedian in his fight with his assailant early on and he's punching through walls mm-hmm. and everything, but we've seen Batman do that. We have uh, at least versions thereof, but he's also in his suit when he's doing it and these people are doing it bare fisted. <laughs> right. Well, that is something that I do think they exaggerated in the movie. Whereas in the in the book, while they there is some fight scenes, they're not as prolonged. Mm-hmm. And when they're done, like the the fight scene with um, uh, when Lori and Daniel yeah. are walking through town, they go into the alley and they get uh, approached by uh, the by this by the gang, and they have a they they take them out. That happens in the book, mm-hmm. but it. But the fight isn't quite as uh, dramatic or gruesome as it is in the film. And then in the end, in the book, they are both wiped. Right. I mean, they're they are like hands on their knees, panting, about ready to throw up. Whereas in the movie, they do it all. They're cracking bones through people's skin and they kick it off and then they, they're they all done. And they just sort of like straighten their coats and go, whew, like that was fun. <laughs> well, and, and, and what builds from even there is... It makes them horny. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, yeah. 
there was even that moment there at, at the end. Like, it, it, if Dan had been a little more, a little more proactive, he, he'd have gotten his way that night. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, yes, they come out of it a lot more energized than they did in the comics. Right. So that's one of the things I liked about the comics is that I think it definitely let you, it gave you the impression that these are just real people. Sure. They are the only one with any true superhero uh, or superhuman powers is Dr. Manhattan. Right. And, and that's how I remember that story going. It's just, it's the only thing in the movie that's a, little off-putting to me is that that everybody seems to have a little extra yeah. something. And that's where a lot of the criticisms of people and fans of the books kind of lean or, or uh, put towards the film mm -hmm. is that um, Zack Snyder turns everybody into these superhumans, uh, even though they're not, it's not expressly said and they're all supposed to be normal people. Uh, he does make them all out to be superhuman. No, absolutely. Cause I mean, I'm even flashing to the scene uh, that we did get in the ultimate. I don't know if all of it was there in the theatrical, uh, but the scene where Hollis Mason um, has to face off against some gang members that stop by. And it, it, it's from the comics. See it. That's how the original Night Owl dies, is he is in a fight in his apartment, and he's obviously in his, like, 60s or 70s at this stage. But in the fight in the movie, at least the ultimate cut, during that fight, Hollis takes a couple of them out on his way out. Yeah, I think that's I think that's excised entirely from the from the theatrical, the theatrical. cut. Yeah, uh -huh. so it, so yes, there there is a sequence uh, in the ultimate cut where they capture that, which was done in the books, uh, but in this case, Hollis is still a badass in his seventies, and it's right. only because they ganged up on him so intensively that he doesn't make it through. But again, we don't get much of an in the way of an explanation as why the heroes seem to have a little bit more something to them. Yeah, so I can definitely understand some people's criticism on that front. Sure. Um, but it's also fun. A lot of those same critics will also say in the same breath, though, this is one of the most... Um, Faithful adaptations? Absolutely. And again, this is even more so when you watch the uh, the ultimate cut. It is almost a, a a scene for scene from the graphic novel, except for the things that they chose to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Snyder went to the point or went to the effort of even some scenes he framed exactly as they appeared in the book. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, no, the cinematography uh, and capturing that moment, that still was mm -hmm. there. Uh, and, and there were sequences while I was even watching, especially Rorschach reading from his journal. Uh, like, I, I, I am sitting there seeing the bubble almost appear over his head because it is line for line out of what came out of the comic book. It's insane. I mean, like... Yeah, I read some criticisms that they thought that uh, while that works really well for the books, mm -hmm. they thought Rorschach's narration in the film, they, they were like, it just doesn't work. They, they, they think it's laughable. And I'm like, eh, I don't think so. I liked it. I don't, I'm a kind of a sucker for like the, the, the Sam Spade style, you know, noir film narration i think that's kind of a hard-boiled detective kind of stuff guiding us through the story i don't know i'm a sucker for it i love it no i i completely agree and with rorschach's character being i i mean the ultimate ultimate introvert i mean he barely socializes at all and even that he's hateful um mm -hmm. and so the only way I see that man getting through his life on a daily basis is with some sort of constantly running internal monologue. So for him to be sharing his thoughts, his impressions in that way, I don't see any other way to do it. I loved it. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think he kind of steals the film. I'm not he, sure he who was really supposed to be the star of this movie, but uh, Jackie Earl Haley as Rorschach, I wanted an entire film of this guy. This, this, that's the series I want. <laughs> Just give me the Rorschach files. And, and that's what I would ultimately say about even the ultimate cut. This thing is such a faithful adaptation, but it, it in nearly four hours, that's a lot of film to try to absorb. Mm-hmm. It almost begs a film adaptation of it broken into its individual parts so that you could consume it as episodes, not as a whole. It's, it's, it's such a good world and it's such a good story and it's too much to consume in one sitting. It mm. just really is. It's overwhelming. Almost need it split into a mini series. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, the, the the heroes and the, and the stars, uh, the actors who played them. Mm-hmm. Uh, right off the bat, I mean, the film opens with the uh, the comedian mm-hmm. played by Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Yeah, I've read that Jeffrey Dean Morgan actually he saw the script and uh, initially said realized that his character was like killed in the first few scenes, and like, no, nah, I don't I don't want to do that. <laughs> Keep reading, dude. Think, yeah, and I think it was uh, Snyder or someone else or his agent you know, went to him like, you don't understand how important this character is. <laughs> you, and yeah, you keep reading. You see him in all the flashbacks and everything. And uh, he, that's what, so he's like, okay, yeah, I'll do this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, you run the entire length of the film. You just don't realize it. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, uh, the comedian is critical to it because uh, he's everything that's right and wrong about being a superhero. This is actually a guy you'd be af- almost afraid no, to have on your criminal. side. No, he's a criminal. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And somehow he, he like, well, he only kills the the worst of the worst, I guess. <laughs> Depending on the but, moment and what he decides is the worst. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, innocence, you know, if they get in the way, <laughs> or if in the, if they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, he's just as happy to take them out. Well, and he is the ultimate nihilist uh nothing nothing matters his there are no consequences to his actions uh everything in the world is pointless he is that present he is that ever even though he's on the side of good he's the one that's saying there is no point to any of the things that's the joke that's the joke of the world that's why he's even called the comedian it, it is the very dark joke that everything we do is inconsequential, which is interesting because he is the linchpin to saving the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got Night Owl, played by Patrick Wilson. And this is, of course, the second incarnation of Night Owl. As you mentioned, he was he took over the mantle from uh, retired Minutemen team member Hollis Mason. That's something, just real quick, I'll jump in, too. The real, I'll, I'll call him... Uh, Super fans of the comic really don't like the idea that the Watchmen is a thing mm-hmm. because apparently that's not a thing. That isn't a thing in the book. Uh, the first superhero team was the Minutemen. Yes. And then when they all kind of went their separate ways, uh, a group of them tried to like maybe get together and form a new team called the Crime Busters, I think it was. But that all fell apart, so there was never a team called Watchmen. So that was something that Snyder came up with to just sort of tie the title in with the film. Well, and, well, and the Watchmen literally comes from... They did the scene in the movie. It was in the comics. It was the paint on the glass in the middle of a, a riot that uh, Night Owl and, and Comedian showed up to break up. But on the glass... It says, who watches the Watchmen? Mm -hmm. It wasn't supposed to be referring to a specific team. It was just that overarching, that looming, that royal we, that who are they and who is watching them. Exactly. Yeah, so Night Owl here is definitely very uh, reminiscent of a certain DC superhero. (laughs) You think? (laughs) Plastic Man, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I think there was a lot of difference between him in the book versus the film. I think in the book, he's kind of, um, he's not so good at his job. Right. <laughs> in the book and in the uh, film, he is like, well, he's Batman. <laughs> yeah. It, it, well, he's at least competent, but the, you get that sense that he was happy to retire. But yeah, he's got he's gotten softer, a little slower. But then, then somehow he can crack jaws and break bones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As soon as the fighting starts, uh, suddenly he's he's back to his old self again. And, yeah. and despite looking a little soft, once he's poured into that suit, suit he, <laughs> he is muscle bound and ripped. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we got Silk Spectre, again, a uh, second generation. She took over from her mother, and it turns out that she's the biological daughter of the late Edward Blake, who was a.k.a. the comedian, mm -hmm. who had a complicated relationship <laughs> with uh, her mother. But yeah, that, that definitely go, delves into some uh, some dark places, uh, even darker when you really get into like the, uh, the book and the idea of the... Uh, I think the book definitely focuses more than just a scene exactly on the sort of how um, male appeal that the female characters were drawn in comics. Well, I was going to say at the time, but even today. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they cut it down to pretty much a scene and a line in the film when he uh, attacks her. He's like, come on, you know you want it. You wouldn't dress this way. I'm like, oh boy. That's hitting the nail a little bit too much on the head. Not that it isn't true. Right. That's how a lot of people think, but uh, it's definitely hitting it with a pretty big hammer. And I think the book was probably uh, a little more subtle and a little bit more, maybe widespread throughout the pages. Yeah, but still at the time the book was out this was not typical kind of things that would get covered in a comic no good point that's true uh ozymandias retired superhero i like this is effectively sort of like uh he's almost a, an iron man character he's like a tony stark and actually, yes, you can parallel that rather quite a bit, because if you get into the Marvel side of things and how Tony had plans for how to save the world from itself, which created um, um, what uh, Ultron, mm -hmm. um, Adrian Veidt is very much in that kind of mental state. Yeah, yep, absolutely. But the whole idea of that uh, everyone knows who he is... And he was able to kind of spin that kind of uh, profit off of it. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we'll go we'll jump to Dr. Manhattan, the only true superpowered character, as I mentioned, after an accident at an experimental energy lab, turns him into a being that can manipulate matter and lives effectively in the quantum universe. I That character is really interesting. And just the idea of, and it's neat watching him and, kind of um hang on to like human humanity mm -hmm. and then but slowly just sort of uh leave it behind and very slowly i mean we don't know entirely how many years decades may have passed um between the time that he became dr manhattan to the events of this this film uh, so, yes, his attempt to hold on to what was left of his humanity and his evolution through it. And I love this character for that, that, that whole notion of if you were to imbue somebody with this amount of power, how much could they co potentially be connected to the life that they ever knew before? It almost takes someone to point it out for him to realize how out of touch he's become uh, when he's tr spending intimate time with Lori and working on the generator. Yeah. A and he's like, no, my, my, I'm, I was absolutely paying attention to you because he can split his attention in a hundred different ways, but it doesn't seem that way to anybody else. It's like, no, you're not paying attention to me. I, I don't have your undivided attention. I, I really like that. Yeah. It was just, fantastic creation yeah it's mesmerizing because uh, literally as a human and, and that's what lori is there for is to remind us how far he ha has evolved beyond us that he doesn't even grasp what she's saying anymore because she can't grasp what his reality is 
she has a really good line. There was one moment when her and uh, Daniel are starting to sort of get close, but she says, uh, he, he, she's trying on his goggles. Yeah. And she says something about, oh, this must be what uh, John sees. Daniel's like, suddenly, oh, your ex boyfriend that I thought was out of the picture and you're still bringing him up. And she comes upstairs and, like, look, John sees a lot of things, but he doesn't see me. Yeah. I, that's a great line. <laughs> <laughs> what you're on to here is is what elevates this as content anyways as a comic book this was so well written and thought out even then as that book and Zack Snyder and that team did not only faithfully bring this to the screen but still managed to elevate it with the acting and, and the additional work that had to go in that that elevates a moment like that, that gives it the power that it had. Yep. Last one to mention is, I think, Rorschach. As I said, Jackie Earl Haley. Uh, he actually, he found out that Snyder was doing this. He was a fan of the book. He actively went after the role. I. He was perfect for it. I'm glad he did. <laughs> yeah. He and his agent got together, and they filmed a bunch of really cheap videos of, like, Roar, of him like doing his, like a, a Rorschach mm-hmm. and sent it to Snyder and Snyder just loved it said yep you're come on come on in <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I mean I can't conceive of anyone doing that role any better than he did um right right down to and it's straight out of the book but but him yelling at um the inmates in the jail oh, telling them brilliant. I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. <laughs> His rage as he, he delivers that line. I mean, you, you could have convinced me right then and there he was going to murder everybody in front of him. For real. Yes. Uh, and they, you know, they, they confiscate his mask. And he, at one point, he, when he finally escapes prison during the riot, and he goes into the office, and he confronts the psychiatrist, where's my face? <laughs> yes. The, the scene when it's being torn off of him, mm-hmm. his reaction, his, his guttural reaction, you could have sworn they were physically tearing the skin from his bone. I mean, yeah. he had that level of commitment to the character. That's one of those roles where you can see other names that they could have been brought up and put potential or whatever. And none of them, I don't think anybody else could have done it as well as he did. It, it was brilliant. And I'm going to flash back to Billy Crudup real quick. I thought it yeah, interesting sure. um, with, with hit, the choice of him for Dr. Manhattan. It, but I loved it. I, I don't know what I ever envisioned reading Dr. Manhattan, but his delivery as a very even toned, soft spoken, yes, yes. almost high in the voice. Mm-hmm. Um, not at all like when he speaks. Um, obviously, you're going to listen because there's a giant glowing blue man in front of you um, who could blink and turn you inside out. Uh, but, but as he's delivering every line, it's just so melodic, so even, so. So unassuming, so gentle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much of that was Crudup approaching the character or how much that was Snyder, you know, his, in his guidance, but it may be a combination of both. But either way, it works so incredibly well. You could have easily seen somebody taking this character and having them speak with some you know, loud, booming voice yeah. or something Insert like that. Insert James and, Earl Jones here. <laughs> Yeah, something along those lines. And and yeah, so Crudup doesn't do it, and then Snyder doesn't do anything to it in post. Right. And it just, it works so well. It does. Uh, and I, I think that parallels with that sense of him clinging to what's left of his humanity. It, it is that whole, I'm just going to be that unassuming... Uh, scientist that i always was (laughs) well and then the fact that he's always so low-key no matter what's going on when he does sort of lash out and explode it makes it that much more powerful Mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah Uh, see 
the scene where he's being openly attacked for supposedly causing cancer <laughs> to, yes, to exactly. everybody that got close to him and him just losing his mind right there. Yeah, and, and, and blinking away to Mars. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. I want to kind of move on. I, I, I don't think we can really say much more about the film because I think it's kind of a love fest if, for both of us. I We both really enjoy the film. Despite what many perceive are flaws, I think a lot of it was necessary mm-hmm. to make it a a film that was going to do something in the theaters. Uh, this was definitely going to be something where you weren't going to be able to appease everybody. No, <laughs> you can never... No, and you weren't going to be able to appease the diehard fans 100%, but I think even the the fans of the Watchmen comic would watch this and at least come out with maybe a 75%. <laughs> yeah. I did throw this out to social media. I've only got a couple responses. On Spoutable, Jim Flanagan says that I liked it the second and subsequent views more than the initial watch. So that was interesting. Mm-hmm. So first time seeing it and didn't care for it actually kind of revisit it and it's grown to enjoy it more on discord Catterberg, she says it was a movie version of a story critical of comic books that failed to realize that the source was critical of comic books the movie was fine but just really missed a lot of marks and certainly didn't capture the soul of the greatest graphic novel of all time so uh, okay uh, that is kind of like the general what a lot of the the, the more fervent naysayers uh, come at it with. I think, I think it does enough. In my opinion, not being as completely well versed in the graphic novel as some, I guess. I I think it does enough. I would agree, but um, since this is the film adaptation. Um For it to work, it would have to be almost an attack on other superhero films, and there weren't enough reasonable ones under the belt yet for it to take on that role. I I really rather enjoyed that it clung to the the noir film style, the mystery, and the overarching notion that uh, um, sometimes it takes doing something truly horrible horrible to to wake us up as a species but i'm assuming the critics um, i'm curious to see what they think because i'm guessing most of the critics weren't comic book readers uh perhaps not but um just doing a a quick scroll through a, a metacritic there's a lot more green here than there is anything else. The, uh, mm-hmm. the critics tended to like this film for the most part, and the ones that didn't, they go a little off the rails. So uh, we'll start right here at the top with the New York Post from Kyle Smith. He writes, Director Zack Snyder's cerebral scintillating follow-up to 300 seems to even weary filmgoers' eyes as fresh and... Magnificent, magnificent in sound and vision, as 2001 must have seemed in 1968. <laughs> Yet in its eagerness to argue with itself, it resembles a clockwork orange. So Okay, interesting. Go over to Entertainment Weekly. This is more in the mid-grade. Uh, you get even Watchmen fanatics may be doomed to disappointment that results from trying to stay this faithful to a comic book and, and and that's one that's a notion that i can kind of latch onto a little bit it's that notion in order to be, remain faithful it has to be huge it has to be long and mm-hmm. in that can you sustain your 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 fervor for this over that kind of stretch it's where i would have said a series might have made this even better than a film unto itself. They tried a series, didn't they? Oh, the series was a sequel, though, wasn't the it? The series is a sequel. I actually okay. do recommend it, and as after seeing this, I may have to go back to that. All right. Um, then we get into some of the darker stuff. Um, this one, uh, we get... Uh, this is from a thing called Film Threat, P- Pete Vonderhaar. Watchmen is indeed gorgeous, with 
Gibbons' original artwork reproduced and in some cases improved upon by detailed FX, but even at a healthy two hours and 41 minutes, the story feels truncated, even abrupt. And, and that's the difference between seeing the various different cuts. Uh, like mm -hmm. we discussed, you watch the theatrical, I watch the ultimate. There is even a director's which sits snugly in the middle. And yes, uh, the theatrical is too little. The ultimate just becomes daunting to watch. <laughs> it's a lot. So then you get NPR's Bob Mondello. Uh, the director recycles some of the better effects from his Gladiator Epic 300, and he is being so faithful to the works of comics artist Dave Gibbons that we might as well have used the graphic novel's illustrations as a storyboard. And I think he that did, pretty actually. much is true. And then the bottom of the bottom, you get uh, the Wall Street Journal, Joe Morgenstern, and when you get, I didn't even know Wall Street Journal did movie, movie reviews. Oh, I, oh, yeah, I know they do. I've heard Morgenstern do yeah, before. I, I, he comes off a bit as somebody that doesn't like movies. <laughs> but uh, elegance isn't Zack Snyder's bag. A certain sort of impact is. Watch... Watchmen establishes him as Hollywood's reigning master of psychic suff suffocation. I don't know what any of that means. Okay. I don't know what that means either. <laughs> but I, as per usual, I, I, I like to save uh, Roger Ebert for last for as long as we have him through our journey. And he actually loved this film. He did. Uh, he gave it four stars. Um... His opening remarks are, after the revelation of the Dark Knight, here is Watchmen, another bold exercise in the liberation of the superhero movie. It's a compelling, visceral film. Sound, images, and characters combined into a decidedly odd visual experience that evokes the feel of a graphic novel. It seems charged from within by its power as a fable. We sense it's not interested in a plot so much as with the dilemma of functioning in a world losing hope. And then, interestingly enough, uh, without reading the, the, the thrust of all of this, but he actually says at the end of this article that he's going back to watch it again. He nice. wanted to go watch it in IMAX, and he basically says, this is a film that will inspire fevered analysis from here on out. Mm -hmm. And here we are in 2023 discussing that. So we <laughs> yep. are living literally what he is uh, proposed would happen. So, yes, no, uh, it was fascinating to read through some of these because you find the haters that are just going to hate no matter what. Um, and then... But for the most part, a lot of people really loved and appreciated this. Mm. So. No, I, I think it was brilliant. I think you know the, the the original story by Alan Moore, and then it being brought to life by Snyder, and and not losing the idea, despite the fact that there are some drastic changes, it doesn't lose the idea that there are people in this story that are willing to do what many would see as the ultimate evil for the best mm -hmm. reasons. And you, you leave kind of going, uh, yeah, that's terrible, but I kind of agree with him. I mean, you, you don't walk away. There is no, there is no like true hero. You feel bad and almost guilty for rooting for the people that you root for. <laughs> no, and I think that's part of the point that it, uh, why this was the anti-comic book comic book. It, it, it yeah, pointed out, yeah. in order for you to do what is right for most, means you have to do wrong by many. Um, right. And then the notion that the, the actual superhero, the godlike creature that evolved from all of this is forced to agree with that very thought that 
I could undo everything the man just did, but you'd be right back where you started. He's he's not wrong. We had to wipe out millions to save billions. It holds a mirror up to so many superhero, you know, whether it be Batman, Superman, um, you know, some of the, I, I think most of the characters are based off uh, properties that Alan Moore got a hold of that weren't being used anymore by a defunct uh, comic <clears throat> company. And he was able to then, you know, tweak them. Uh, I think even like Blue Beetle and a few others and stuff and, and, and make them his own. And by doing that, he just holds a, a, a mirror up and it's almost like a funhouse mm-hmm. mirror. Or uh, it's one of those lot of sort of magic mirrors that you know show the your your true inner yeah. you know, self sort of thing, and so instead of you know rooting for this Batman, oh isn't he so great? He goes and fights crime and is like he's a criminal. You know, they, they they're all criminals. You understand that, right? And some more so than others. And honestly, this fits nicely. Uh, un- unfortunately, it fits nicely into kind of where we are in history right now. Um, I would dare say this isn't just an analysis of uh, uh, of comic books and the heroes that we have elevated in there, but of history itself. I mean, if you dive too deeply into those that we have elevated to almost godhood throughout history, right down to George Washington, they weren't always good guys. Yeah, no, exactly. No, that's a very good so, point. This goes deeper than that, and this part of what I love so much about it is, I mean, you can, there is layer on layer in here if you're willing to devote to it, and I think they did. Very interesting. Uh, I'd love to hear if anyone else has any thoughts now that I mean, you didn't comment on the social media, but if you've listened to this episode and you have your own thoughts, we'd love to hear them. So please uh, drop us an email, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com, or follow the link in the show notes to all the social media sites and leave a comment there. Uh, Tom, uh, awesome. This was a fun this time. This is also the one time where I go where while our uh, theme is, well, it looked pretty, I think it was pretty all the way around. Apparently only barely made its budget back. And that's probably why it fit into our category. Yeah, it, it mm-hmm. wasn't as well received in the box office as it should have been, but it has a place in my heart. No, absolutely. And just despite what you think of the story and the changes, I I think anyone would be hard pressed to disagree with the fact that it does look amazing. It does. <laughs> no, oh my god, it does. Well, the next film we look at is another film that is based on not on comic books, but off an animated series. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize how well these two would kind of dovetail off each other. We're going to look at 2010 Space Battleship Yamato. So we are going over to Japan for our next film. Mm-hmm. I don't have much to say other than this is a property that's near and dear to our hearts. Um, and this is the only live uh action adaptation of this to date so tune in in a couple weeks to hear our thoughts on that film until then thank you all very much for listening we'll be back soon bye see ya